Uh, yeah, I probably, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss of what's going on. Uh, the only thing I can think of is um, the Zoom room is logged in, but you didn't, you didn't log into the Zoom room. That just defaults to log yeah, in. Yeah, it's just the room itself. I, I logged into um, the stream, the general Granicus account with the stream password. Yeah. Click it on the, the Zoom room icon, and then it just pops yeah. up. So there's nothing for me to log into. Uh, yeah, I haven't okay. even right. I haven't even entered my Office 365 credentials. I've just been uh, I just have my laptop. So yeah. I'm not sure why it's doing that. And it joins the room. The council chambers joined because I can see it on the planning account. Yeah. Okay, Chair, we're going to make it work. Board member Blink. Here. Board member Cordaway. Here. Board member Moore. Here. Vice Chair Walter. Here. Chair Folks. Here. We have for us the uh, minutes, so if you've got a chance to look at them uh, from the 7 7. Are there any corrections or additions? We have one small change um, under the members present. It should say um, Vice Chair instead of Acting Chair. Oh, that's the only correction. I think that was from the Oh. Okay. With that correction, do I have a motion to approve? Excellent. Second. 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 Homes being added uh, to the Mills Act list, uh, bringing the total to 11, whereas a total of 10 were, room for a total of 10 was originally approved. That is factually correct, but is that something to be concerned about, or there be not following the. He was a cap that the city council imposed on itself. So they were able to simply disregard their own location. Any comments or questions? All right, so what is the post? We don't have that on the whole problem. We have to have, we still have, we still have to have a rule. No, no. Yes. see, that's okay. That's all we have. Board Member Blake? Aye. Board Member Cordaway? Aye. Board Member Moore? Aye. Pastor Walter? Uh, Chair, folks. Uh, all right. Moving to oral communications, this report from the meeting of the individuals to address the board on matters of community interest, not on the agenda. Um, anyone in one of the uh, three minutes? Anyone like to? Seeing that, uh, we'll move to board of staff analysis. So, Senator, we can get the. Uh, 
Outrun Preservation Foundation will be hosting their historic preservation conference in April for Mason San Francisco. Uh, the city does have funding to bring two board members along with myself to that meeting. So if you want, if you're interested in coming, uh, send me an email. And we'll see if you have more to be willing to uh, come to some process of who would go. Yes, I have a conference. I will not do it. Hopefully, we will have two. Any other any uh, board announcements? Yeah. All right, uh, so we'll move on to new business. Uh, it seems like we just let the chair and vice chair, but apparently it's been a while. We also have the SARC advisor for 2023. And we talked about that last time. Anybody want to have a refresh our work on that? So, yes, we do have the 2023 chair and vice chair. So, for the municipal code, that is elected uh, beginning of the year, your first meeting. Yeah. Uh, the board also needs to select an advisor to decide our picture review committee. So, the SARC is a subcommittee of the planning commission that's uh, chaired by the vice chair of the planning commission and then the, the next person in line. So the code requires that whenever the planning commission considers an application pertaining to a start resource, that a member of HPB serve as an advisor to the design. And so as noted, we do have an item that will be considered by the SARC at the February 28th meeting. And so whoever is appointed that presents the complex, then the board should also consider appointing that alternate. So we ensure we have coverage. So we're looking for four four roles with the chair, vice chair, start and start. I mean, potentially, I mean, alternate is not necessary unless the individual selected has a conflict on the, which should not happen because the 28th is also the night of the end of joint planning commission HPD study session. Uh, so that study session would begin at seven o'clock and probably would begin at six. Hopefully, it shouldn't be fine. But if there is, I'd just be aware of that. Any questions with Daniel? He's all right. Given, given the name, the architectural review, is the requirement that that person professionally has an architectural background? No. In the planning commission and design architectural review, there's no real requirements other than being a resident of the city who's older than 18 years old. Anybody who's interested in serving that capacity. Um, and generally, this is uh, so in situations where the planning commission is rendering a decision of that application would also separately go to the HPB. So, this particular application will go to the HPB to start planning commission. And so, we actually recently changed, actually, today changed the scheduling for that item. If I recall correctly, we'll go to the HPB first. In February, and then to SARC, and then the Planning Commission for decision in March. Um, discussion um, on the SARC. I've been on the SARC. I can continue, or somebody else wants to be the designated SARC person. I'm open. In terms of the other positions, I've opened anybody open that wants to put their hat in a ring for any positions. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we um, elect um, Bob Walter Cheer for this year. All right, we're doing separate. Yeah, so we did do the separate motion. So one motion for okay. the start and a separate motion for the chair and vice chair. All right, so we got we have motion for chair, second it, any discussion? Can roll call, please. Board member Blake? Aye. Board member Cordovic? Aye. Board member Moore? Aye. Chair folks. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, thank you. Thank you. So now the acting chair in the minutes, no person that's back. All right, uh, and we uh, why don't we do the vice 
request to share next, and then we'll restart. Yes. Do we have anyone interested in the vice chair position? I'll, um, I'd like to designate Susan Blake as vice chair, if she so desires. I'll second that. Motion and second. Any discussion? Seeing them, we have all Board Member Moore. Board Member Cordway. Aye. Chair Bones. Aye. Vice Chair Walter. Aye. Excellent. Um, congratulations. <laughs> and uh, the SARC advisor, again, you, you said you were, you're welcome to continue um, or some of these interested in, in being on that. Um, I, I, all right, we have some interest. We have a second. Second. All right, we discuss it. Blake. Aye. Board Member Moore. Aye. Vice Chair Walter. Aye. Chair Bubbles. Aye. Excellent. Congratulations. Thank you. Good. You're, you're already in by acclimation. All right. Um, so do I turn this over to you now? The half of now or the next thing? No. It happens. It happens. That's my thought. There you go. I'll need to hear the all right, carrying on, there is a, uh, we just talked about item two, so moving on to item three of the study session, the historic preservation ordinance update. Yeah. All right, I'm going to have to move along to shirt this part. No worries. Yeah. Enough. Thank you, Mike, for your service as chair. Oh, yeah. Nope. Well done. You're very welcome. I tried to get you on that stage. That's a word toss.
right. well, thank you for everybody's patience. Now we our Zoom technology. So this is the third study session on the Star Federation Ordinance update. Uh, we have already discussed uh, previous meetings involving uh, penalty provisions, permitting requirements, and now we are discussing the Mills Act program. So this would be the conclusion of the three part study sessions. Uh, to me, the board can come to recognition this evening. We will then reconvene as a joint HPD Planning Commission study session at the Planning Commission's regular meeting on February 28th and the reschedule at 7 o'clock. Um, if the, we do not have a quorum of the Planning Commission, we'll just hold that in a 7 30 and just have a later start time for the Planning Commission. Probably anticipate uh, about a one hour block for that meeting. Uh, following that, then we will go to the April 4th City Council meeting, inform the council of uh, the work that's been done and of the HPB and Planning Commission's recommendations. And then ask the council to authorize preparation of the ordinance based on those recommendations. So at that point, the, the council would either give different direction or not authorize the third party. So um, the first item on the way this uh, meeting will be structured, we'll just go over some of the challenges and then recommendations. And as we did in the last meeting, we just take it piece by piece by piece to see where there's consensus amongst the board and where there are areas disagreement of any. And so we can have a kind of good sense of where we stand. So in terms of the challenges of the existing program, um, and these are the four big ones that we identified staff report. Uh, principal among them, it's the list of eligible improvements uh, that in those act can fund is very broad. The list that's in the application list is over 100, very detailed. It is not a bad thing, it's actually a very good thing. Unfortunately, that list was never approved by the council. So fundamentally, there's been a lack of buy-in from the council. And we can see at the most recent council meeting in October, where even though these contracts did have works as a skinner remodel, so that was allowed by the application forms and council questions the appropriateness of that. So we want to make sure that this time that whatever list is created, that the council sees the list and has a full understanding of what we're talking about. In terms of uh, review criteria and threshold of approval, the, the current process is based on concept of ranking, but there was never a really clear basis of what one application should be denied. Um, we want to change that so it's much more clear that there's a minimum threshold that one would need to satisfy in order to get the contract. Uh, with regard to duration, uh, all the contracts have 10 year work plans, but it's currently structured, these contracts essentially run in debt. And so it's unclear what happens after 10 years and the work plan's exhausted and but savings are continuing to be uh, reached by the property owners. Then lastly, ongoing compliance. Um, don't know staff report. I think at the very beginning, there was some sense that the accepted office would be the clearinghouse for receiving invoices and that ended up not being the case. Also been some staffing challenges to ensure that inspections are being conducted over time. That reflects both uh, some limitations in staff time, but also just the simple reality that a program that runs year after year after year across different people, it's hard to maintain consistency across staff members. So we find a way to solve that. So going through staff recommendations. Uh, first one, we're looking at eligibility. Uh, under state law, uh, in order to be eligible for a Mills Act, the property needs to be either listed on a local list, such as the city's historic resource inventory, the HRI, or the state register. And that's minimally what's required. The staff is also recommending that, in addition to that, we allow potentially eligible properties to apply, subject to them applying to be added to the list in contingent upon council approval of that. And this would work as an inducement to get owners to voluntarily add themselves to the list. Um, and we can tie those two things together. So we'll start, we'll end with that one, see if the, the board is supportive or not. Very supportive. And I really like that we would be able to add property and that would be extended uh, eligibility for um, the expansion of the historic buildings. I think that works. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. Yeah, I think this is entire uh, right to pass this and I think I think it, it 
does work as an incentive, needs to allow uh, amendments to do that. I do think somebody who's been on the list for 30 years uh, might be a little preference, but for this Thank you, Daniel, for what you did here. And uh, I think the the eligibility requirements, as far as uh, well, the, the, the types of projects that can be uh, tax deducted, I think importantly, as we go down that matrix, is is in line with. The conversation we had with the city council in October, where it's not just any expense, a new toilet seat, a favorite example. That you know, it, it, it's and it's in line with the projects that would require typically historic preservation board approval. That that's that's you know, what's that's the alignment there, and that was supported that idea. Particularly by the mayor, that, that that was, but but as well as the rest of city council. The the five per year limit, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not going to apply science to that. It, 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 I I just think so that so long as there's room to grow it every year. Uh, oh, yeah, so if I can expand. So moving forward on a number of contracts, so looking to recommend getting away from that overall. Cap, which is very arbitrary, and obviously it's not great if everything's going to be it's not arbitrary, but trying to have a, a five per year limit as a starting point so that we can see how the program is working. And my conception of how this ordinance would work is that the, the bone of it, the fundamental aspect, would be codified as an ordinance into the municipal code. But certain elements, such as the number per year, could be adopted by a council resolution. So after a few years of the program working, it can be administered effectively, and it's fairly straightforward if the council is willing to allow more per year. But five feels like a conservative number. I would give you see how it goes the year after year. Now, for this to be fair, uh, we would likely need to establish a application cutoff so that all applications can be reviewed concurrently, uh, particularly if there are more than five, so they could be ranked. And then we would need to make sure that they could be reviewed, considered and approved in time for them to be reported prior to the end of the year so they can take it back the following tax year. Right. So is the board, well, the board with five, five per year starting point? Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. Five yes. and, and I know we talked a little bit about that. So I always forget the city's calendar year starts in June, fiscal year. Well, or would the, this be a calendar year? This would be a calendar year. So in order for the tax savings to begin in next tax year, which starts in fall, the contract has to be recorded uh, before December 31st. So, so with the idea that we would do cutoff sometime in January, February of every year? Yeah, probably be more mid-year. Sure. Uh, yeah, that would be enough time between then and before the end of the year to do its normal process. I'm just picking like last year when we had it the year before that, we did, we had yeah. the, the, it took uh, six months to a year for that process to go. Sure, I mean, that also because we didn't really have a lot to work with and a lot of those have had on uh, trying to create a system to compare the applications, but ideally it should be a bit more straightforward. Okay. Right. So June would probably be a fair time point that would give staff a month to review at most and go to the board and then go to the council to the next few contract. And that would interfere with, um, uh, I know we always had the, um, uh, after mid-year of June and July, there was the work, I can't think of the word right now, the work plan that you guys had to develop or? Uh, well, the, yeah, I'm sure the, the city council tend to be busy towards the end of the fiscal year with the budget. So they're working on budget, all the parties have a work plan item, which are all the activities they want to do in the following fiscal year. So, but if staff accept that fish in June and the board's looking at it in the summer, the council's reviewing it in late summer or fall, which is a vote time. Because okay. I'm in favor of both eligibility and the number of contracts. I think that all makes sense. As am I. Okay. And then looking at consideration criteria. 
trying to create kind of a minimum floor of what is acceptable in terms of a proposal. The proposal that did not actually meet the consideration criteria basically wouldn't even be brought forward for consideration because we just don't even meet the criteria. Try to keep it simple in a, in a way that just reflects what the council is trying to say and making sure that this money is used properly. So first off, demonstrating that 100, at least 100% of the savings is reinvested back into the property. So you have an investment savings ratio dividing the expenditure by the tax savings of 1.0. And then secondly, showing expenditures of at least $100,000 in 2023 dollars. Now, this number here is kind of an average of the current 11 contract, which showed um, savings of $105,000, but actually expenditures of closer to $160,000. The idea here is that if the city is going to go through an effort to hold public hearings, review documents, report contracts, and have an overseas contract for 10 years, it should be issue orders. The $100,000 seems to be kind of a fair point based off the, the current contracts they have approved. Now, obviously, this would mean that if a homeowner does not show expenditures of over $100,000, then they would not be eligible. Now, that may not necessarily be a bad thing because that would imply that the property is in relatively good condition such that they do not need it. This number can easily be you know, pushed up or down depending you know, on the board's discretion for recommendations for council. I, I do want to point out that the, the so that's our target is the, the 1.0 investment to savings ratio. Therefore, yeah. the, the element just keep in mind we, we've looked at historical data based on the audit that we talked about a couple months ago where we were very liberal with the amount of expenses that were eligible. Therefore, the, the, the ISR numbers here could be considered a little bit inflated. Just you know, but and 2.77, 2.35. Okay, maybe if we put the new um the new standards of what is an eligible expense in there, you'd have maybe something more. 2.2 or 2.0. It's just keep in mind that, that these numbers are, are, are going to shrink. So I think that the 1.0 requirement, uh, the 100 percent ratio, while that may seem like a big drop from some of these numbers, it actually is in lockstep with how we would expect the numbers to pan out if we re recalculated them based on eligible expenses. And I was going to ask on, on both both points: Are those um, potential, um, for lack of other liability, in the sense that homeowners might argue that the Mills Act was not intended to have these restrictions in it? And I don't know. I don't know if if we say you can only permit if you're spending over a hundred thousand dollars. Is that in the Mills Act statewide? Is that other cities have that same component in there? The law is very broad. I mean, the, wrong, the law provides a framework for cities to create their own programs. It's not the case. So they're exceedingly tailored from community to community. Um, this city, the city council, wants to look at programs being very much to support uh, capital intensive projects uh, as opposed to more routine maintenance. Um, that's not the case in all the cities. A lot of cities, they just, the benefit generally provided to uh, property owners. Uh, some cities actually, one city in particular, the city of Orange, which is in North County, used the Mills Act as their means of store preservation. They don't actually have local store preservation at all. They just give out Mills contracts to anybody who wants them because that's how they get people to preserve their homes. So, programs vary wildly. So this is well within the range of reason. It's not arbitrary and it's knowable up front. So, you, you know what you're getting into and you don't like it, then you don't have to apply. Well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in favor of staff recommendation. I think it, it's a good A, it fits with our current mosaic cuts. It gives us not just apples and we're now we're talking about you know, one house versus another for the more than five a year. Um, and I think over 10 years, you know, even for a modest historic home repair, we're going to be spending over 10 years. It's not, it's not all year one. 
Right. Yeah, I mean, it could be all year round. Right? I mean, you could spend hundred thousand dollars in year one, and you're spending the rest of the time recouping your savings, and that would be perfectly fine. Right. If you have one big project. So one one question then, if it's we're basing on ten years, but you said the contracts are going to go further past ten years. So then, if they do all their work within the ten years, and then they're done. This contract was on 15 or 20, then isn't there concern that they're now still re benefiting the savings beyond the 10 year point? Yeah, I mean, well, we'll get to that in terms of duration. But yes, I mean, this is that uh, a 10 year question. This is assuming that $100,000 of expenditures and $100,000 of savings within 10 years. Obviously, there's that relationship does change, and we'll get to that in the next slide. I'm, I'm a bit. So to you contract duration. So as a reminder, with the Mills Act, um, all contracts have immediately a 10-year term on them. And then every year, one year gets added. Now, initially, we took that to mean that if the city wanted to have a contract that lasts only 10 years, we could send file by notice and not renewal as soon as the contract is issued, and then 10 years would run down and not to fire. Now, that is technically true. Well, we were unaware of is that upon issuance and there's a non renewal of savings start to evaporate really quickly. It emissions in year after year after year, it just fills out the cliff. That's just the way the law is structured. But minimally, any contract will have functionally 20 years on it 10 years of full saving and then 10 years of diminished savings. So, what we're referring to here is the initial term is the amount of years before the notice of non renewal is issued. So all these numbers would have 10 years tacked on to them. So these are the numbers of full savings. So instead of a, kind of a simple arbitrary um, expiration date, what we're trying to do here is to relate the time the contract will last relative to how much money is being spent so that the contract holder can at least be made whole. So if we look at this, if a homeowner is saving $100,000 and they're spending $100,000 in 10 years, we cover that. But if they're spending, say, $300,000, but only saving $100,000, and it would take about 30 years to do the savings. So you have two variables of how much somebody is spending and how much they're saving. Now, how much they're saving is very much a reflection of when they bought this property, and of course, how expensive the property is, since that directly relates to the property tax savings. Um, this is highly conceptual because there's a lot of, I mean, I've been on the phone with the county assessor's office, and they actually do this math every single year uh, for all the properties in the county. All the Mill properties get reassessed every single year. Um, and it's, it's a very technical process, but there's Despite the day, there's going to be a lot of variation to this, particularly if the property changes hands mid contracts. And when we figure out what that is in the future, but at the kind of high level, this is what we're looking at. So, we make sure that the duration of the contract is tied to how long it will take to recoup the expenditures. So, it will vary. Can you have a question about if the property is. Can you, can you speak a little? I have a question about the. If the property is sold, it follows the property, but it doesn't have any, does it inhibit, inhibit the new owner? And obviously, it has to be disclosed with the sale, but. So that, that's been a question I've been pondering because it does present a scenario where if a new owner buys the property and the previous owner had owned it for a period of time, the new owner will now reap a greater tax savings mm -hmm. than the previous owner. The previous owner was paying artificially low taxes because of proper team limitations. So normally when you resell the value, it resets. Mm -hmm. But with the Mills Act property, that would be the case. Mm -hmm. So the contract is actually more valuable to the new owner. That likely would change the calculus to when the city would actually be willing to issue the notice of non-renewal. So if uh, owner, if this was a certain, if the understanding was that the expenditures were going to be recouped over a certain number of years, and then with a new owner that changes, then we would need to have a conversation with that owner and see um, 
either we would just need to terminate the contract earlier so that there's just not a lot of savings that are being unexpended or that new owner would need to voluntarily offer additional improvements to the property and we would either sign a new contract or an abandon the existing contract. Speaking from experience, there, you know, a historic house is going to need, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, it's going to need constant work to keep it up to the par without the lapping. So, you know, it would be a big benefit for a new owner to have that, but they also have to want to love that property and do it the way it is. I mean, and that is the purpose of the mill set, is to not lose historic properties. Yeah, and the, that situation can be very specific to each property, yeah. exactly how much is sold for, how much the savings are, and what work still needs to be done in the property. Right. But from just a policy perspective, though, this is why this is still, I mean, again, very broad, but this is kind of the baseline that we need to be looking at terms of determining when the city would issue that notice and not renewal. Now, I mean, strictly speaking, the staff recommendation is actually we would inform the owner that we would be seeking to issue notice and not renewal unless at the end of this term, the owner has additional work that remains undone or they can demonstrate they spent far in excess of what they told us they were going to spend and they need more time to recoup that expenditure. And then if that were the case, we would bring them to HPB for recognition of the council and either a new contract or an addendum to the existing contract. By the way, just to formalize that the city either recognizes that, yes, you've done a lot of work, we've documented it in another 10 years, or yes, you're going to do this extra amount of work, right? And here's your extra 10 years. Or it could be they just exhausted what they need to do, and then the contract will just come to an end. Thank you for clarifying that. Just a comment. I, I really love this, this chart to me. So, maybe not. I was around. Yeah. But what I, what I like about it, it really does create some flexibility. We talked about before. It gives us a new deck to take specific projects that somebody has to do. And that's really all they plan on doing for the house is to send them back back in circulation for somebody else to use. But as you said, there are flexibility if you are having ongoing or continuing work. Um, and the homeowner, because we're talking, about the, not the second 10 years, they still get savings in excess of the work they did. It's just not multiple times. Saved. So they're still, still, they're still in a net positive position with an improved tax, which I think is, is nice. But you also, you know, you can tailor it to the project. So that's one. Just... Your comments about savings in excess of the amount to invest in. Uh, is that a situation we're trying to avoid though? Yeah, I think I think the problem is because as of the cliff issue, which I still don't understand all map on the basically depending on house property, et cetera, it's gonna be very different property to property. So this is easy to kind of for that full mills act, it's easy to calculate this is your savings and this is what you're investing. Once you get to that, you give them the notice and on rule that, that last 10 years, it can be very different property property. How much paying on the other, the, the, the property set that, how long you owned it. So the homeowner will end up having additional tax savings versus the state money. Yeah. Um, but uh, so at the end of the day, right, we're, we're really focusing on the full initial term, the full initial term, and the, the rest is just, you know, the benefit of the homeowner. Hopefully, they are continuing to improve and save them. Right. I mean, the whole time they're under the Mills Act, even the last 10 years, they need to you know, maintain the property. Right. So, if for some reason that property starts to fall through here, disrepair, that would still be something that would be technically violation of their contract, even with diminished savings. On that note, is there, and do we, I don't know if we want to do this, do we want to put in a provision that says, going straight symbol numbers here, 100,000, 10 years. You're done, but you still have the benefit for the next 10 years. We want you to come back with a work plan of how you can still maintain and do things, other additional things based on whatever those savings may be. So, not this just doesn't go 10 years stop and then now they just get a full benefit. Well, I, I, again, at the end of the initial contract term, we were a year before 2020, we would inform them that you're now at the end of your initial term. 
they need to make a choice. Either do they accept the contract is just going to run down? Do they have more work or do they spend a lot more money than they anticipated and they want more time to review it? Then that would be basically their three choices. Um, and there would be something that would be disclosed to them upon you know, application of the contract. So they would certainly know what that would be. And would that be written into the Mills Act so that they know it as well as we, everybody else is, knows about it? It's not a, a separate city contract that we're not aware of. Maybe. That would be that would be a question for a city attorney. I'm not necessarily sure the city would want to bind itself unnecessarily. Because see, a future city council may have a different opinion on this. A future city council may say, well, your contract term is up. Uh, and that would be their problem. Um, I mean, this is this would be a administrative practice to take people before the council, before their application, before their contract expires out. I don't necessarily think the city would want to compel itself to do that because the agreement is really just that initial term. That's all we've agreed to. Everything else is completely voluntary. If in the future the new city council doesn't like the that program at all. Uh, they cannot be found by their predecessor council. So that point, I would, I would think that we would probably not want that in the contract. Okay, but at, at year nine, if we issue a non-renewal, they still have 10 more years in the contract. Yes, but that's so why they're having to finish their work at 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now they have 10 years of still some benefit, even though it's going down. Yes. So then how do you just we, come back, yeah. come back and say, hey, by the way, we want you now to spend more on those savings without having it documented somewhere? I mean, basically, the last 10 years are just uh, a giveaway. There's really not a great way to account for it. Yeah. It's just the, the last is a good thing for them, the perk, but there's not a great way to program that money. So if they sell it at 10 years, it just stays with the house and the new owner gets that benefit for 10 years. Yeah, it's a diminishes each year. They would certainly need to close that they're on the board decline of the contracts and the contracts turn down. And is that an automatic? Because it seems like that if someone does sell their house no matter what period of time in there, why would why would that agreement carry over to the new owner? Wouldn't it just terminate right at that point? Or is it because it's a the agreement living is a living agreement yeah, is going on? Correct. The agreement runs with the line. Okay. And the, the 1.0 ratio, I, I was I was trying to wrap my head around how that works, that calculation works over the last 10 years. And because the savings, the denominator goes down each year, that number is more likely to uh, be higher, but that number doesn't apply. Uh, Correct. For our purposes, we're basically ignoring the last year. Okay, okay. And then <clears throat> that is a, 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 an initial approval criteria. The one, the one point on Correct, which is why this table is what blacked out. Those are those are scenarios that fall below one. And, and how are we going to handle show estimated expenditures of at least 100000 in 2023 dollars? So we're going to have to do an inflation adjustment? Very good question. Very good question. Uh, we will need to give that some thought. <laughs> Yes, again, just one question on the whole thing. Actually, you know, that actually may be an argument for not actually extending contracts beyond 10, 15 years. <laughs> the inflationary factor are going to be because we have a few more years like this year, though. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely fair. Well, you, you can also tie that to the, the CPI index, too. I mean, a lot of times we do that, so you have that as a threshold. So it's not necessarily something you have to, have to come up with some. Through the magic per se, we can use you know, processes that are already in place for other loans and things like that to, to justify it. But that would almost put the contract owner in a position to having to honestly spend a unknown amount. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, they're also budgeting for 10 years at $100,000. In 10 years, we're going to spend more than $100,000, anyways, right? Sure. I mean, and you can also argue that. Well, that dollar today is going to be. Not worth a dollar next year, so they're going to end up everything's going to just go up and then think goes nothing goes down, yeah. So we move to Mars, that's a whole other story, but it's all going to go up. So yeah. we're still going to 100,000 
And you can also argue too that both sides of this equation are actually being adjusted for inflation currently. I mean, a lot of guys, your property tax savings under Prop 13 and Save Your Mills Act, but it does add up every year. You're saving more and more and more because otherwise, without that protection, you would have been paying more and more and more. So, in a lot of ways, your savings is effectively going up as your expenditures are going up too. So, there could be an argument that both numbers are basically normal. Well, in the end, we're not trying to make this a, a, a penalty. We're trying yeah. to make it an incentive. So right. some of it we're talking about allows us so we can understand all the parameters, but ultimately the city will decide how they want to do it. And it may not be as hardcore as we're talking about it. It may be, look, we're going to keep it simple so they enjoy it. We know they're going to get a benefit after the fact for 10 years or whatever. It's going to be less. But, you know, we're talking, right now we're talking 11 homes, not thousands of homes. So we're trying to get a few more in there. So... You have one hundred thirty-one million. Right. Right. Yeah. I I just want to be cognizant of the fact that the savings number will actually be adjusted for inflation as it is because that's how those calculations are made by the county and they put in the inflation here. Is it the expenditure? Is it going to be cognizant that there's going to need to be some math involved? Yeah, I mean, but. Again, this will never be a perfect calculation. This will always be kind of a rough approximation. Yeah. I mean, I'm speaking with the county, the how, how they do who the savings is very detailed because it actually takes into account inflation, um, which is strange because in, no, it's based on a rental basis. That it, um, I imagine some properties will end up spending a lot more. I mean, there will be a handful that spend less, but. It's just uh, at the outset, why we make sure that the plate is set so that at least there's a fair understanding of both sides of what's expected, right? Right. It, it just, if we codify statements such as $100,000 of expenditures in 2023 dollars, we, we just need to anticipate and it will be that involved. Well, so actually, when I was saying $2023, I didn't necessarily mean for purposes of looking at over 20 years from now. I meant that. If our first contract were evaluated today under the new program, we would be looking at expenditures in hundred thousand dollars today. Contracts in 2024 would be hundred five thousand dollars. So that's the number. That number would change based on, and we would just update our applications to refer to that. That's a baseline. That's a baseline. And I, and I forgot you're right on the um, on the assessment from the county every year. They're going to change. So, right. again, they're going to go up. So, you're going to get more money and you're spending right. more money. So, yeah. it's going to probably, yeah, yeah, it's probably going to balance out. So, there's no problem. No need to really go into the CPI index and things like that. Yeah. It just gets more complicated. Okay. Well, so is the board in agreement with this approach? Yes. No. Yes. I didn't know. I mean, do we, is there any desire to have uh, maybe a cutoff in 25 years, 30 years too long? Just get a little bit of 20 years. I think it should be fun. We've, we've had this discussion before, and there wasn't a time when I think most people agreed that 20 years seemed like. I just want to know, this is just a, this is the recommendation you made. The board is yeah. comfortable just providing something. I mean, I, I still think it should be well done, but it could be a still a strict cutoff where in no case shall you ever go beyond 20 years. That would still allow people with that would allow variations based on expenditures relative to savings. And I, of course, will always be the dissenter because I want to see those head of the state 50 years from now, even more than him. Uh, I always want a historic house to remain historic and not be all those. Yeah, I guess from my perspective, I'm fine with the 30 years given, given that I'm almost kind of 20. I think what's more important is what Dan said earlier, which is this is not a cliff to fall off of. As long as you're doing more improvements and more yeah. things, you're already in the queue, you already have those out. The way this reads, you are likely to get another one, right? So yeah. it's not, you, you just have a new mill, yeah. Mills Act contract coming up because you've shown such good progress. Right. So to me, it, it kind of is, you have a lot more. Proof of your work that you have to go through, right. but right. but the idea is if you're continually restoring a house, it doesn't. You you're not going to take it out of the pool. You can still provide. And the way the math works, you know, if you chart it out on a graph, you think you've got 11 houses right now, 
even if they're phased out over 20 years, and every year that we can add five. So it's, it's, it's going to be sort of a you know, increase parabola. <laughs> so it's going to be up and to the right and then flattening out, but never going down. We have a lot of pressure to develop the vertical and cram. You know, so I would say, you know, we have to sort of have this. I'm saying that the number of houses that will be eligible for Novak is always going to go up. Oh, really? That's a, well, that's how the map operator. Yeah. It will be nice. Yeah. We just need people to sign up. Right. Yeah, exactly. There's there's an allowance though for it always to go up. Yeah. The, the derivative of the two creation rules is too much. <laughs> so I'm not saying that it makes sense to start a hard cap other than just the relationship between the two variables. Okay. Well, I think we were 20, 30, or not, but, uh, but I think, yeah, to me, to me, it was to have a, some cap somewhere in there. Right? So, right? Yeah. 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 Or what? Well, just put the chart, right? But it then has us 30, right? So you can apply for up to the, your initial application. And really, 30 years, 40, when you have to add five, so that was four years. For me, it was just trying to make sure that this is a benefit, and so there's an incentive yeah. not to do this over 100 years. Right. You want your house to be preserved sooner than later so yeah. that you it's going to stay stronger rather than if someone comes in and ends up doing little bits and pieces over a long period of time, mm -hmm. then they're always chasing. You know, they're just about being done with one thing and the thing that they could have done before now catches up and it's just a vicious circle. So if it's incentive to get it a little bit faster, then I think that would just be a benefit. Yeah, and I think that what what I like I put in I thought I put on the 30 was really more about the numbers is that if you're in a situation where your savings where you want to do a really big project, you're one, right? And in the middle of big project, I know sometimes it's expensive, but it is common. So um then if you can lock in, yes, I'm going to get back my, it's going to take a while, but I'm going to get back over the third year. To me, that's what sold me on the 30, is that you're getting, for an initial heavy expense, you're guaranteed where you did the 20 year cutoff under this same chart, right? Then you're, you know, you would get half, you know, you get two thirds of, of what you can invest in on the 20 year. Right. Well, I think ultimately it's going to come down to, if we're using 100,000 as a baseline and we can apply for this, it's different 100,000. Someone comes in and says, I want to spend 300,000, then the city's going to negotiate what that duration of time really should be to make sure so, that they get the benefit of it. Well, again, yeah. that's what this is trying to do, right? Okay. Yeah. Or the city is <laughs> um, And so, yes, I mean, it depends. I mean, $300,000 can be recouped yes. as a dollar for saving. I mean, if you're saving $100,000 every 10 years, then we get 30 years. Three thousand dollars over ten years, you can save that ten years. I mean, it's relative to both the, the value of the property and how long you own it. But I mean, fair point in terms of trying to push people to work faster. I thought that some comfortable balance between the two. <laughs> because arguably, you just spread this keep moving right. I mean, 40 years, 50 years, and right. how long is too long? Right. Right. But argue that there has to be some cap. Well, the other thing, too, that I think historically, I know when I bought my, my current house years ago, is that on the average, people live in their home for about seven years. So if it's seven to 10 years and they're coming in with a plan that's based on 10, but they know it's going to be 20 to 30, are they really going to be there? So now we're, we're persons, if that's the case, and they're moving, then they're leaving stuff on the board that they haven't finished for the new owner and then they're coming in. So is that good or bad? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I would point out too that disclosing to a prospective owner, here's a whole list of things you're contractually obligated to do. But it's going to be a difficult sell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or here's all the stuff I need to do. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask that question earlier, but I, I, I kind of I not seen any not seen in our city or other cities a let's attach the mills act to this house and then sell it. Um it seems economically that would be a smart thing to do. 
because if you have a house that you bought for 100K and it's not worth a million and a half dollars, right? And you've got the Mills Act, so you really, you know, when you sell that house, it's not getting the full assessment, it's getting something in between there, between 100 and 500, but a lot less. It seems like that's a huge incentive for the buyer to overpay because they're going to have such a lower assessment. But I haven't seen that in any other cities where there's been this, let's attach a Mills Act and then block the property. I mean, if there were an open ended contract where there was a more flexibility, I could see the value add. But if the contract comes with strict terms as a proposing, then probably less value because it comes with a very specific list of things that you need to do upon purchase. Well, I think that's good because yeah. you, don't, you don't want it just to be used as a tax mechanism, right? You know, yeah. We're buying a house because they want to preserve it, not buying it because they exactly. tax rate. Oh, yeah. When the dollar were here, 20 years, 30 years. This it is a reference. I think the reason why is it's really not that part of a cap, really. Is. Yeah, it's like, they could reapply. I mean, whoever bought it at that time could reapply if it was still in existence. I mean, who knows what yeah. we're going to be in 30 years. And as I think about it, too. I mean, the curve, you also have to remember there's a curvature with Prop 13 savings versus Mills Act savings. At some point in time, I think Prop 13 savings will eventually eclipse your Mills Act savings. So if you're in that property over 30 years, it actually makes come to the point where you're not really seeing any more money. 30 years also does tie to the standard 30 year mortgage, so it has some reasonable comparison. I'm not opposed to 30. No. I'm not opposed. So just for the record, the consensus that it's a 30 year. Yes. Okay. Yes. In terms of the review process, most of this is pretty usual. Um, the application package that we have was created over. 11 years ago, I believe. So that will need to be replaced and we kind of brought into modern times and city modern government online and geo permit platform. So that'll be something I work on other, other side of this. In terms of application fee, um, you know, the subcommittee did find that city the city's current $1,600 fee is kind of typical. And so staff is recommending no changes now, uh, but just evaluating probably over the next couple of years. Um, it's likely the process will be quicker and less staff intensive since it'll be much more simple. So we may be able to recommend in the future that it be actually reduced. In one or two years of experience will let us know if that's the case. And in terms of a free application inspection, uh, the subcommittee did recommend that we do that. So that would basically be kind of a courtesy service. A planner would go out to the back of the property, uh, this property owner to look at home. Explain what the program requirements are and just provide kind of just advice. If this is an application that would maybe be worth the Mills Act or the Planning Commission. Uh, I mean, obviously, the homeowner can do what they want to make a pitch, but it would at least provide opportunity to try to you know, discourage somebody who probably doesn't need the Mills Act. Well, I was say on that, it would be a little bit easier now that we're doing um, projects that are available will be exterior primarily only, so it's you really see it easier yeah. unless it's something interior because of fire safety or something else that's unique but most of them are going to be exterior based so inspection wise and reviewing would be a little easier okay i mean this is really just a, a slightly hands level cup of service every work through i mean a big part of the planning department is just provide guys and feedback and people ideas let them know if those ideas have any you know they're viable or if they're just completely uh other parts same idea here, we just be doing it at people's homes as opposed to say home. I just want to say, I really like this idea, and the, the two relatively really go together. I think the application fee, as you said, is fair given the jurisdictions and the staff work involved. I think for the homeowner, it's really the thesis for it's going to the black box and might be whether you would like to approve not, and you really know what it's like. Whereas with this pre inspection, you're going to have a pretty good sense of. At least when the staff person goes out there, 
you know, you've got a bunch of stuff that, that's criteria for it, and then you really don't. And I think that hopefully encourages all owners to say, gee, I, I, I'm applying for the right things. I'm sort of investing in this Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a great idea on, on two fronts. If, if you're going to have somebody pay from a thousand dollars for an application, they want to see some, you know, bank for, for the buck. And that's a great way to do it, the, you know, the consultative process. Because we've also talked about it here an education process for those that buy homes you know, in the inventory that are historically significant. Uh, that is not a consistent process. People could buy them really <laughs> technically, you know, the real search is funded, but it doesn't always happen. This is a way of saying, hey, by the way, just in case you didn't know, if your home is, you know, on this list and, and there's some things, it's, it's, it's kind of an outreach program. And hopefully, too, particularly useful for properties that are not on the list currently, but are potential properties. You can explain what it would mean to try to go through the mill process current, concurrently with your HRI application. Hopefully, you do some people voluntarily add a property, particularly because, um, or to call it the first study section we looked at, not requiring historic resource analysis to add your property. So, if we kind of lower the bar to get you off the list and for that type of formal review, it only be required if there was a disagreement between the planning commission or the board or the board specifically requested or the council specifically requested. If there was consensus among all bodies, then you wouldn't have to allocate a thousand dollars for a form for a resource analysis, right? Hopefully between that and this, get the properties off the list. And then in terms of hearing process, no change. So that would still just go to um, a 3 b for recommendation to the city council. No need to involve uh, the planning commission. And then lastly, in terms of technical reports, this was also a subcommittee recommendation. Basically not require those reports upfront as part of the application, but only as condition of approval when it was necessarily evident that a certain school report was necessary. And so that would be required after the council approved it, but before the contract was executed. So if somebody said they need to spend $100,000 on foundation, they're going to need to furnish some evidence that that's in fact the case before we execute the contract. Because what we don't want to do is put somebody into a contract that they can't fulfill. So all good? Everybody? Yep. Yes. Now, in terms of uh, conditions of approval, I recommend that the new ordinance have a specific provision that allows the city council with a to recommendation to impose conditions on a case by case basis. So these conditions are going to be specific to your property. So, for instance, if there's a property that has um, clearly a legal addition, then the city would require that they require that to be demolished as a condition of the Mills Act contract. And, you know, we could work with the owner for some of these things that we need to demolish in year two so that there's enough time. Or uh, if during if the property may be not great repair, landscaping needs to be replaced, fencing is dilapidated, chain link fencing, whatever the board or the council feel is necessary and appropriate to just improve the property specifically, those could be required. I mean, this concept can go a lot further. Um, I mean, some cities require that you actually force owners to get full electrical inspections or I mean, really anything. It's, it's an agreement that some things that the city has a priority for some things versus others, so it's going to be imposed. But as an open ended allowance to impose conditions of approval, we could figure that out on a kind of case by case basis. And then over time, as we learn from different contracts, if there's something that we want to kind of create as a standard condition, we can easily do that. And idea here is that the ordinance should be framework and have a straight jacket. So a lot of this will be done kind of a, either by council policy or just kind of an administrative practice. And then in terms of program oversight uh, slash annual maintenance fee, so we're looking to use the My Government Online system to kind of require property owners to create an account so that they will upload receive invoices as they spend money. So instead of asking for the stuff every year, five years, just let them upload it as they get. 
And so we can just have these active case files and homeowners will just be able to give us materials on a basis. And we can use the system to also just monitor in real time what cards are being issued. Um, you can also use the system to create reminders for infections. This is the infection can be done initially, and then I think every five years. And so having to remind every five years is long. People come go with the city, so it, it's very easy if the person by position leaves that nobody remembers to do these inspections. And so this would allow all the system to provide reminders to the whole planning vision. I think that's yeah. a really good idea. Yeah. <laughs> now um, there was a city that we found that who had struggled to do ongoing monitoring. And they actually established a fee that then was used to hire an asset consultant, you know, in historic, uh, it was a store and it was a architect. Basically, they, they would take that money and they, they would pay the consultant to come out and do inspection on several houses in one day. Uh, that might be necessary in the future uh, because as whatever part I mentioned, I mean, every year you just add more and more contracts. So after 10 years, there's over 50 contracts. Okay. So, uh, there may be a point in time where we do need to impose an annual fee on property owners. So we would be looking to at least create the, the ordinance would have an allowance for the fee to be created by resolution city council. So in the future, the you know that represents the council, but you not necessary, they can do that for that But in the immediate term, it's probably not necessary. Yeah, I like that recommendation, especially to your point about. Ideally, we are going to get a lot more those acts and staff will be overwhelmed. And I don't want that to be a game changer. I think this allowing the council to move that forward creates that ability to sort of keep up right in the community. You know, and some of this too also depend on what the staffing model looks like uh, in the planning departments. I mean, as you're probably aware, we're planning for a lot of new housing in the next kind of month, forever ago. <laughs> So uh, planning departments everywhere are simply growing, so there will be some more planners. So in high this may just be something that's easier to be absorbed by the staff. So three minutes on this. I'll read. No, I'll read. Thank you. And at least. All my improvements. So, we're going to go through um, all 90 different line items, uh, just like we did with uh, December 5th. So, we'll see uh, where the agreement or not. This is uh, not a science, it's a bit of an art. The council's direction it was pretty clear from that they should fund structural, architectural, and historic integrity or projects that benefit the structural, architectural, and historic integrity of uh, historic resources. So we took that term structural to mean both the, the literal structural, which are like the foundation, as well as basic building systems that pertain to mechanical, electrical, plumbing. And then in terms of historic and architectural integrity, that's kind of the exterior work, looking at building, just windows, cladding, roofing, anything that makes a home, the home, the character defining features. I mean, there's technically a difference between architectural and historic integrity, but with this sort of home, this they overlap so much and combine them into the same category. Now, then we also excluded anything that was relatively a minor cost or more routine activity so that we're not funding everyday expenses as deemed by the council. Um, so, like, this, this objective, um, we're trying to find a, a balance, but uh, get into it. We went through thresholds of what requires what type of permit. Right. Here we're seeing what work is subject if can qualify for a Mills Act agreement. Yeah, so the thing list I did span it list. So this list was that list plus the list from the current application plus the subcommittee's categories. Combined together to create a much longer list. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's also a, there's also nuance in terms of permitting procedure that's not relevant here. So in terms of street facing or not street facing, that's not particularly important as far as a, a mill site contract. So we we'll pull that out. So here, for instance, um, looking at um, 
you know, packing a roof that's just a relatively minor work that's ineligible. Now, a new roof that's a like for like or restoration of an original material that will clearly be an eligible thing to set the integral to maintaining the structure as well as architectural historic integrity. Now, what wouldn't qualify is a new roof with a different but non original material. So they, the homeowner, for some reason, would try to replace their uh, Spanish tile roofing with composition, even if that were something that the board would maybe approve for reasons I don't know. That would not be an eligible application for a mill back improvement because that's not something that really facilitates the architectural or historical integrity. If you had a wood shingle roof, you can't put one of those on. But there may be a type of roofing material that would more closely resemble shingles or such as top. This is why, again, there's going to be a lot of nuance to this, and, and this will be kind of a broad outline. I mean, the process, I mean, we're going to try and make it as objective as possible, but there will be a lot of nuance like that for each application. You know, that will be something that the board will have to consider as part of a review. So uh, I don't know if you, you want to go through all of these line by line, or if there's any particular ones the board disagree with. But yeah, I want to go through last time through each category. Yeah, there is, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. So, so that's how this is set up. So there are about 13 slides, I think 13 different categories. So this is where I'm the roofing category. So maybe if there are any objections, we can discuss. I have I have none under the roofing section. Yes. The only question I would have under number four with alteration is if you had historic photographs where there was, for example, a dome or a gate or something that was there, and it was taken and gradually increased, there was something that was on the house that was taken when and put a new roof on, the great expense of architect wanted to need to re recreate this current. Um, so I'm thinking about something like that which would I guess it would be an alteration to the current roof, but it would be restoring it to where where you could see it was historically in the roof. So would that? How would something like that fit in? Well, that's certainly uh, that could be worked as an exception. And you'll see that throughout this list that uh, trying to highlight that restoration is certainly an important and eligible offense for the very reason because that's the historical narrative. I just think that it's, it, it was you know, keeping it. Or it is but it's not historic, it's much cheaper than trying to recreate it. So, you want to pick yeah. those details to okay. yeah. I think the important part, particularly given that there's 90 items, is are we one uh, staying true to some sort of guiding philosophy? And, and the way I read it, thanks to the president of my mother. That which is ineligible is typically that which would disqualify the house from maintaining in in the inventory. It's either that or it's something that's a routine for a routine for a and, and I think maybe just you know adding it in so as long as we're being consistent with the process and then adding language in there at the discretion, you know, all these are but mere suggestions. <laughs> These are sorry, these are our guidelines. However, everything is on a case by case basis to be determined by the improving body. Correct. I mean, in reality, of course, I'm not black and white, but there will always be some level of discretion imposed in terms of review and board member more common in terms of exact grouping material that's verified. Okay, so we will add uh, restoration that. In terms of alteration to building roof, what happened? All agree. Yep. Yeah, agree. Yeah, windows, door lines, and shutters. Basically, um, none of this would generally be eligible unless it's um, a restoration in terms of number 10 and 12, and then the replacement of existing doors. Uh, that would be acceptable within the existing frame. So basically, the idea of creating new door openings or altering openings would generally not be okay because that would disrupt the historical integrity unless it's a restoration project. So we had an example of that I think a couple of years ago on Alabama where somebody was 
bringing a new window, and they actually have a photograph of the house with that window. <laughs> uh, so that would be an example where that would be okay. But a homeowner is voluntarily adding a window where there never had been a window. Uh, that does not facilitate the building's architectural or historical. Might uh, be something that the board may not be okay to approve as part of a permit process, but not necessarily fund with no that half dollar savings. The third minutes. I'm assuming in the, I think, I know the answer, assuming into this, if you have to um, when there's some weights and all that, that have been painted shut or and weights on all that, you're restoring what is taking all apart, you're re putting in the Hang the sashes and the everything, putting it together that would fit within within this. Sure, because again, the um, the broad thing too is that I mean, under state law, plus also the city's local requirements, whatever you do to your house, also needs to be consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards and the city's local design guidelines. So, for instance, when number nine, you place an exterior doors and windows, uh, that needs to be done in an historically appropriate way. That's always kind of based on something in this case. Agreement with windows. Anybody else? Anything else? Okay. Are we allowed to ask questions at all? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was thinking we would do public comment at the end, but the, the chair wishes we can do public comment at the end. Um, if I may ask, is it relevant to what we're talking about right in a second or the two yeah, that right? The windows are just the historic classroom. Uh, can we run through all these? Well, if you don't mind, let us run through everything and then we'll look like so let's open up the end and then we can hit some of those specific items. Is that, there might be other questions. Thank you. All right, so we talked about roofing windows onto the exterior walls. Okay, so exterior planning. So much of this is uh, would be allowable uh, in terms of one of the larger scope of projects. Like full house repainting would be acceptable, but touching up minor paint or uh, that needs to be fixed or not. Uh, same thing as uh, restuccoing, provided that it's like or like. Again, are we going to be trying to change the stucco that would not to a different type of texture that wasn't original, that would not be appropriate, hence not eligible for the um, and number 21 is another exception that if you're doing a new type of wall cladding that's different, that generally would not be acceptable unless it were for a restoration project. I'm fine with this section. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. I would propose that pressure washing exterior walls. Um, would be protecting the historical integrity, mm -hmm. the structural integrity, and just making it look nicer without replacing anything, finishing. That's just, that's just a problem. Because I mean, that's something that I think would be beneficial and not insignificant um, to the overall. My, my only comment on having I just done a recent historic house is uh your pressure washing for the historic house is gonna take a lot of paint off. And so pressure washing is part of a of a repainting job. I could see that in fact, but just pressure washing might make your house a little shiny, but you're running out a lot more water. And we've seen a ton of water damage where yeah. pressure washing when you have Proper yeah. it, it breaks the seal, and it actually will have a ton of moisture to get into it. So, so as part of a larger painting project, that would probably be in the budget for the painting project, the pressure washing. But I, I worry just having it for the standalone. I would agree with that statement. I've seen homeowners do pressure washing themselves and really damage their homes by doing it. So, unless you had a professional doing it as part of a paint job, I would then I would go along with it, okay. but I wouldn't necessarily. And that would, I mean, somebody proposing the pressure washing as part of a paint job that would, be, that would easily fall within mm -hmm. one item. Right. So consensus on exterior walls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Architectural elements. 
We're looking at the exteriors of the building, porches, patios, balconies, chimneys. So generally, repairs would be acceptable. Uh, removal, alteration, new, uh, not uh, the restoration. I'd like to make a comment about a few things here. Um, as people age, they may need additional support on porches. Um, they may need different kinds of handrails going up and down the steps. They may need alternate front porches or back porches or stairs. And I just wonder how specific we have to be with some of these things that, that we're talking about. Um, I, and I'm gonna go back to roofs for a minute because um, we also have to keep in mind about the, envi the change in environment. And we have to keep in mind energy improvements. And there's just a host of things about, like if you have, old wood shingles on your house and you, you decide that they, they you could get something that looks like wood shingles, but it doesn't have to be wood shingles and it would be more energy efficient and lower their, their heating costs or their air conditioning costs. I think we have to have a little more flexibility in some of these things. And then I'm gonna go to windows. Um, I think you can get replacement windows that from the outside, look like an original double hung window, but aren't in fact double hung windows. They're dual pane windows, and they are again, more energy efficient. So if we're just looking about the integrity of the house, what it looks like, and you maintain that architectural integrity from the exterior, I think again, we have to have a little more flexibility in, in what we say can and should happen with a historic home. I mean, we, we, these are these are buildings that people live in, and I think they need to be safe and they need to be comfortable. And I mean, it's just it's not just one way. That's me. Just one thought, I, I think that like, I, I understand where you're coming from. I do believe, that, just like the roof discussion we talked about, the shape roof, shape roof is that um, if current code doesn't allow something, we can't. Within all these environmental codes are going that way, especially at point where we're going to have, you know, the things and all that. Um, so, when those things are, so for example, I mean, did all of those be pain, very much be pain, but this is one. In that case, you're replacing the window. And the, we don't trump the state law, so you would have to have pain. So, I, 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 think, I think the rules get you there because we can't, I mean, we're, we're kind of secondary over the state. Actually, the state used to be primary. I don't know where it is now. That's what I'm saying. So they, they come out and say everyone else to be double hung if you're replacing it. I'm sorry, I'm double paying you. The fact that we want to just keep it. Preservation. Oh, you can do that. I don't yeah. know if it does anything. And the second thing is the, the window. So the exterior door and the window is number nine. So that's pretty broad. It just said replacement exterior door and the window, windows and open. So what we're doing here is actually protecting the opening, generally speaking. All right, I mean, if you have an existing window, uh, you're probably replace, um, replacing it with a different window that eventually it looks the same. That would be acceptable to still keeping the, the opening. That's really important. If you were just trying to triple the size of the opening, yeah. that would be a problem. <laughs> uh, I mean, so, and that's where it becomes more elective versus trying to maintain the original appearance. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that would be, that would follow. Now, in terms of the roofing, I mean, that's a fair point. I mean, if the rest of the board feel that it's too restrictive, I mean, number three could be revised a bit so that the, the like for like is termed as comparable in appearance. Mm -hmm. And then that could be kind of decided upon a case by case basis. I mean, that so introduces a little more subjectivity, of course. I just did my roof for the second time because it's been that long. And the first one I did was uh, shingles on because that was the original roof, but it really wasn't smart to do it this time. We had far too many fires and indications mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe I should 
and the city could give me permit. So um, I went with a different route, but I didn't. Yeah, I, I would say we, we should add a little flexibility there because I know I replaced my route a year or so ago because I, I was forced to because my insurance company said we're dropping you if you don't change the route. <laughs> So I don't know yeah. insurance people are going to care too much that your house is built in 1800 versus 2022 when it comes there. So we might be forced to do that. So I think I, I agree with Susan. We need to at least have whether we do it in each category or we have an overall statement that just says we are going to provide some flexibility to account for yeah. code, energy, insurance, all those other things. So when it comes to those, yeah. we can try to do it as best we can. Thank you. Okay, and I, and I think that at least the way I read these things, again, for now, I, I can see the flexibility of the unit, but maybe it's maybe too near to getting too, too specific, but to say something that, you know, that these, when your application comes in, these factors will be evaluated. Right? So that these aren't ineligible, can move to eligible, depending on the circumstances. Right, because when they come to us, or have come to us, to show their projects moving forward, we're also going to ask them: Are they going after Mills Act? Do they have Mills Act so we can try to dovetail this together and make sure that we're not causing problems? So, like I said earlier, some of the things that we might approve over here don't qualify for the Mills Act. So now this is going to have to dovetail together. And if we have something that gives us a little flexibility, so we can discuss it, to make sure we're not putting a, a homeowner in a tight spot that they can't get what they need. As a whatever reasons. That, that's going to be great. I mean, we have to be a little cognizant of not. I mean, some of these types of requests will require formal application by the board or to the director. We can't pre approve something as part of the Mills Act that's still subject to a subsequent city permit process. Um, and I understand it's, it's a lot of detail. But the challenge is that lacking that level of detail in our problem. Because I mean, principles, broadly speaking, are subjective and they can be interpreted very differently. Right? Um, so, but to some degree, I think mean, I certainly recognize that. So, there's that's why the, the term restoration is found throughout. A lot of that is very much trying to do that. But in terms of providing more flexibility, I mean, I'd like, instead of the life for life or new roofing, again, comparable in appearance. Terminology that at least gets to the end of what we're trying to do. Or, I mean, we could also do, or like to chime in on this, is we can just put an asterisk or whatever you want to put in the of those items that we want to give a little bit of flexibility. So we, they know that, okay, there's 96 items, and out of those 96, there's 10 of them that we're going to have a little bit of flexibility because we want to see what they're presenting, what's available, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that way, it's, we're, Making it detailed enough, but also giving them a little bit of flexibility. Was, I don't remember when the Secretary of Interior's was, was written, but it was many years ago. And we did know that California was going to go to the greenest place in the world. Now we have to design and build and really account for that at the same time. Uh, all right, so were we on architectural elements? But I'm, I have no issues with this. Anybody? No. We're in consensus on that. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the board is on an agreement with uh, Sir Walter, the um, aspects where we would identify some improvements as subject to the level of flexibility. Yes, I agree. And, and particularly if this would be in compliance with. ADA. Well, that's, I guess, a little different. So, I mean, that, that's a better now. Well, this is also where it gets back into the council direction of if you need to increase the accessibility of your house, but it has nothing to do with your historic house, that has to do with you. Um, and that would be the case regardless of where you live. It's, it's a balancing act of what is really particular to the historic house versus the house generally speaking. Now, there could be an argument that it's more difficult to create, to make a historic house accessible 
than it is for a general house because we wouldn't want to do a simple basic ramp right into the front door. Right. It would need to look a lot nicer. Maybe it would need to be integrated to look like an expanded porch of some sort. So there, there could be a greater upfront cost. But we can certainly add um, to this category, you know, accessibility improvements, recognizing that there is a greater complexity to achieve such a project in compliance with the public standards. But I feel we're talking about uh, we talked about this in the way discussing structures in the project in the community. Sure. But if you're in a wheelchair, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, you know, I agree with you and the council. That is that is an issue for all of us in the defense, but I um, just don't see what it fixes me. Doing that with my mother and I think anything you don't need to make a change to the historical component that she wants. So why is it happening for that? But it seems to fly in the face of trying to yeah. preserve the house for the Mills Act, but right. with an individual, you're going to have to take out a stairwell and store a stairwell to have a bathroom and, and wall and do things like that. So I mean, they're kind of unfortunately. You know, I, I, I would concur. Yeah, and actually, could think about the exterior access actually was on it is on the list of number 37. Okay, moving on to additions, demolitions. Um, obviously, all these would be ineligible with the exception of demolishing a non regional portion of the structure, permitted or not permitted. If somebody has a 1960s edition, closed sunroom, they want to just remove it all, check out the foundation. Now that would be a restoration type of activity that would generally be appropriate. But otherwise, uh, modifying the building in any of these examples would all be held up there, but in many cases not appropriate. I concur. I concur. Just a question. I assume the relocation um, is because it's just a weird one-off thing. Because if I mean, as soon as the time because if there were this historic house that the city, you know, we had the one with the church here that had a historic structure that they that somebody wanted to move versus the mall. Oh, Hamilton Avenue. Yeah, Hamilton Avenue. Yeah, Hamilton mm -hmm. Avenue. And uh, so we were encouraging that to preserve that mm -hmm. structure, and then it fell through. It did. Um, so, but that would be a good use to me of, of Mills Act. So I'm trying to figure out: is it on here just because it's a weird one-off thing? <laughs> I mean, technically. I mean, the, the site context is important to historic integrity. So, moving a building from its original location greatly diminishes its integrity. And by San Jose's collection of historic homes mm -hmm. in that park of theirs, is you know, like, grossly inconsistent with what we prevail in historic preservation practice. It's just preferable. It's demolishing. Yes, yeah, so it is the step above demolishing. It's better than demolishing, but not necessarily something that should be funded by the taxpayers. That, that was the thing. Yeah. I can't tell you that my historic home has been moved three times. Yeah. Really? <laughs> well, yeah. I think and the then, movement, yeah. yeah, the movement of a of a structure yeah. here yes, is sir. not you're not doing that because you're restoring and saving it less as a freeway or something. So they make it coming its way. In my view, in my view, as a as a Mills Act saving because you're not okay. I'm gonna move over here because I want this site over here. I want to rotate it to look has a better view or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not a Mills Act component. It's more preference that they're doing that. Once yeah, they move it and they get to the new location, they want to say now, hey, I'm gonna we want to restore and preserve that side. Then those things fall into other categories. The answering yeah. house was moved yeah. because yeah. eBay wanted to start. Sure, but there wasn't a Mills Act paying for that. If that it was, was a the, private house, there could have been, and I would yeah. support that. And I would point out too that under the current and the post permitting procedure, removing an historic house is of the highest level of scrutiny, subject to CEQA and city council approval because it does have a, an impact on the integrity. Mm -hmm. What if it's David Copperfield doing a magic trick? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, okay. oh, we'll talk about that. Okay. Any objections? Everybody is in agreement with this section? Agree. All right. 
in terms of uh, mechanical, we're looking at the, the larger cost expenditures in terms of a new HVAC system, right? so it's going to be venting and duct work, uh, but lesser costs that are a bit more normal to homeowners, such as the water heater or all house down, or just maintenance and repair of such systems would generally be excluded. Item 38, when it says new HVC system. So if they don't have HVC and we're adding it, that would be eligible? Arguably, it makes them yeah, makes makes more eligible. Yeah. Sure, but yeah. because the yeah. Mills Act was, was not designed to make you more comfortable, it was to restore an old structure and its, uh, its integrity. Yeah. True. Now, but this is kind of the broad understanding of the structure and integrity that. Having this sort of house be usable a little bit yeah. makes it last longer if somebody wants to care for it and live there. Sure. And this, yeah. the, you know, world gets hotter. Uh, updating it, it with you know, modern conveniences. Yeah. And to some degree, too, I mean, remodeling your kitchen is much more elective than an air conditioner in 2023. And recently, people need air conditioning because homes are, big, are not comfortable. And as it is, the states already have to look at requiring air conditioning as part of. The building code because it's not currently the requirements for heating, but the code was written at a time where heat wasn't as hot. It's not actually required for cooling uh, for new homes. So we actually had situations where developers didn't install air conditioners in their below market rate units. And so now in our new contracts, we have to force them to install air conditioner because there's nothing in the building code that says they have to. So to that extent, I mean, insurance, the usability of the house kind of seems important. Particularly homes that are older. By the way, the 2022 energy code now requires basically heat pump systems, which are all electric, and those come with air conditioning. But those are you're you're forced to have air conditioning even though you don't want air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> well, and by installing those, you're reducing the probability of mold growth in your home, which is to maintain the energy. Again, this is where there's Art versus design. Right. Right. I'm, I'm not opposed to it. My only thing was when it, it comes through as part of the review and the permitting process, we're going to want to just look at if you're, if you're adding air conditioning, you're convincing that's going to be somewhere on the property and just making sure that it doesn't become a deterrent from the look of the building. Yeah, and that's actually a good example of a condition approval. So, somebody could propose a new AC system and then the condition would require. That the convincing unit be behind the house. That just be part of the deal. I didn't notice they were doing that in the boilers. So I think we're all in all agreement on our mechanical? Yes. Yeah. Okay, moving on to electrical. Uh, whole house requiring a significant cost to come like older homes with older electrical systems, but uh, the rest of this would generally be in electrical because it's relatively minor or elective or more related to people's desire to have a car charger or a whole house. Would electrical service panel upgrade be eligible? I mean, if you're having to rewire your house, assuming your They're panel required. would probably need a new panel at the same yeah. time. Yes, because it might be an old knob and tube system or whatever it mm -hmm. and so they would have to do that at the same time. Yeah, this is kind of like the power walking whole house paint. Right. Maybe we say whole house rewiring and or electrical panel related to that work, and then item 45 is just electrical service panel upgrade because they just want to change it. Would 43 then fall in the same boat? Uh, potentially, because if the outlet, they have to rewire, they might have to change out all their, yeah, their I, outlets. I thought with 43, I was thinking more in a, kind of a smaller standalone situation as part of a, a remodel of a, of a room, maybe the you wiring new outlets. So I think it's that report, give the example, you want to mount the TV up in the wall, you want to install a new electrical outlet right there. It's an entirely So maybe 44 is whole house rewiring and then parentheses. <laughs> Associated panels, electrical outlets, etc., with that are associated with that. 
Yeah, I'm going to be exclusive. I think it's from the environment. I think it's sort of that you are in this just community provided in the laws, the right work that how it's been done. Well, the only thing is 43 says very specifically installing new outlet circuits cabling. You're going to install new circuits cabling and outlets as part of the rewiring. So someone might right. say, oh, I can I can do the wire, but all my outlets I have to stay. Uh, I, can't, I can't replace it. So someone's going to come up and ask the question, then we're going to be back again. Well, you can say the whole house through and can't succeed. What's that? Yeah. 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 You want to list one of the list because then we'll be we're all, all agreement with everything else? Hi. Agreement. Time to uh, plumbing. So, again, I know you're clapping the house, but are they eligible? Or nominal work, repairs, particular fixtures would not be eligible. And then, in terms of uh, having to run new lines, you know, while that's not uncommon for homeowners, presumably older homes. This may be more of a concern for your older lines that need to be replaced. So, did I identify that as important to the structural? Yes. <laughs> I don't have any issues with the plumbing section. Uh, uh, plumbing section. Yes. Yeah. The, the only, the only, I mean, I understand your question on, on the board. I just I guess I wouldn't want to see a mill type. I mean, those can be very expensive products. There might not be a way to redo all those lines as well. I wouldn't want to see a mill that discuss the greatest in the whole thing. To me, that's kind of those are expensive things. I probably took it home on it, but the low priority for the historic cities. And so, so, to that, I know, I mean, I know this has been, been out this for a long time, but some cities can be more prescriptive where you basically demand that homeowners do these things first, and these things, and these things. But it never seemed, from my observations of the board or the council, that there was any desire to be that prescriptive. To some degree, I think there was a sense that we trust homeowners to know what's best for their home. But if somebody for some reason proposed to do that and you go to the house and there was an obvious visual disrepair, then the city's never obligated to for contract. Even we have all these requirements, we're not binding the council's hands to. There is an exceptional process where somebody's clearly making a bad faith application to kind of recognize. Uh, fire protection. So I uh, always remember one of our fire marshals saying the best way to save an historic house is to install a fire sprinkler system. So that's a very good point. <laughs> Some years later, so looking at the fire blocking and fire sprinklers as an important structural integrity projects as smaller smoke alarms, CO2 alarms for that. So on that last one, I don't see how installing a storm detector would not help out the historical integrity of the house because if it burns down, it doesn't change. This falls under more of a relatively small cost. Okay. All right. Are we all agreeing with fire protection? Yeah. All right. Moving on. I mean, Honestly, if you were up to me, I would almost require people to do fire sprinklers because of this. But it's a break, it's that, that, that policy judgment of how much government you want to tell people to do versus how you do their own perspective. So, why well, this is very much in our. Okay, moving on to structural foundation. Uh, all these are very clearly, directly, literally related to structure integrity and all these be out. I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement. All right. Okay, moving on to site features and accessory buildings. 
most of this would not be applicable as to do landscaping, fences, uh, separate buildings. A um, couple of exceptions, though. Now, we did talk about him maintaining a heritage tree. So, heritage trees are a different, so it's a protects a, a lot of different types of trees. And those are the protected trees, meaning you get a permit to remove them. There's a distinction between a heritage tree. So the code allows this our preservation board to actually designate any specific tree, not like a species, but actual uh, one tree as a heritage tree. Uh, we have not done that, I think, in probably since I was an engineer. It's not something you know, generally people want to do because it really has no benefit other than just making it more difficult to remove the tree. Because now that tree is protected, even if it were otherwise protected. So in this particular case, if somebody had a large tree that was decades and decades old, counting on photographs, well, I mean, there's an argument that it's important to the property that if they were willing to designate it as a heritage tree, you know, that could reasonably be seen as an eligible expense. And then number 71, this is kind of a general exception to not really finding accessory structure, but if there is a an original accessory structure that it may be important or uh, integral to the history of the house. That could be something that could be seen as important to the historical integrity. We only have one um, Peter Drive, Carriage House, I know. <laughs> a rather comparable structure. Okay. 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 Person, an old. What was that? Uh... I guess any any separate um, detached garage would be considered a carriage house in, in this scenario. I, mean, I suppose if it were built at the same time as the house, because yeah. when but you have a detached garage or something like that, mm -hmm. is that part of the original structure? No, it was built in 1933 when the house was moved to its current okay. location. So it's not as old as the house. And this would also require a homeowner to document that it would. Good. Everybody okay? I'm okay. All right. Hold on. If 66 were in place in 1907, we'd still have a tree on the site of Psycho Donuts that Theodore Roosevelt planted. <laughs> and now it's in Los Gatos. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, interior remodels. Uh, it's pretty clear from the council's direction that just remodeling your house, new appliances, countertops. Uh, none of that's going to be eligible. But we did want to include kind of a, a minor exception for some of restoration work. So if there are period details inside the house that generally are not otherwise protected by the city's historic preservation uh, requirements, but if a homeowner wanted to repair them, um, like the stairways as well, that those would be eligible. Refinishing the you know, original wood floor, so you have to maintain their craftsmanship. That otherwise would be lost if they just decided to just remove those features entirely. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. Yeah. Good with the section two. And condition of approval too, or something like this. I mean, we could require the homeowner to photograph everything once the work is done, provide high quality photographs in the city so that even though know, the public can't see it, you just have evidence that work was done. Okay. This is the drainage and water protection. So different ways that a homeowner may need to protect their home from water, from I mean, you know, regrade the house, and so on a vapor barrier, a sump pump, flashing, mm -hmm. all generally important in the community structure and I have no issues with this one. Me either. The, oh. Other and you know, other maintenance, you know, some of this is kind of life safety, such as you know, lead based paint, mold remediation, asbestos. Um, insulation kind of goes to making sure that the house is you know, potable as an air conditioner, for example. Most of this uh, type of recommending as being helpful, with the exception of more minor weatherproofing, that's you know, my house. I have no issues with the section. No. Mm -hmm. That's it. Awesome.
So if, we, if no one objects, I'll open it up for some questions from the audience. Do you want to clarify? Yeah, do you want to clarify how many minutes they'll have to ask yeah. questions? Yeah. Um, but if you come up to the podium, just uh, state your, your name and your, your address. And next one wants to send Alice. So, Barbara does that. So, that's why. Right. Oh, great. Uh, we were part of the ordinance before 2018. And 2018 was a bit more flexible. So, on the topic of windows, in order to, the whole point is to preserve the historic glass space. But with the orders of 2018, how you, the requirement of like for like is no longer there. So, I was a little bit curious about you guys, what do you think about that part in terms of especially a couple hundred thousand dollars? Going forward, we'll see people replacing all wood windows with vinyl. That's happening. But um, I didn't see a like for like on a lot of buildings here. I think. Uh, Secretary of Ontario demands like a lot of elements. It's not in this list. So are we getting more lenient in terms of historical preservation or what are those thoughts about what qualifies? I, I heard your comment too so about the look from the outside. Does it look the same that that might be a qualifier? But is that really what's going to hold up across the board? That's what the other years that we start to diminish the so I can respond to that. So I mean, broadly speaking, the, the law requires that any work funded to build that contract be consistent with Secretary of Interior standards, and that's separate also to from the city's own permitting process. And the board, I mean, what what that actually means is the broad. I mean, some cities do require I mean, wood wood windows everywhere. Um, the city is you know, a little more flexible, allowing uh, clad windows that look original. And basically, storm preservation is something that's done at a local level. So if the city feels it's appropriate, then it's basically appropriate. Um, so I would just say to that, I mean, everything on this list, it's all presumed that if this is proposed, it has to be done in a way that's consistent with the guidelines. But the guidelines says it's like for like, but the city is not operating under those terms. Well, um, I think there's probably some disagreement with that terminology. No, but that's not the simple thing. If you have wood windows, would you expect those windows to be of wood or should that be vinyl? The city has generally not allowed that to be vinyl. Now, since in the past, we have allowed, and I think the guidelines actually speak to allowing vinyl on windows that are not visible from the public right of way. And this is also, and then this goes across more into the, the permitting thresholds of acceptability. But it's all to say that there will always be a, a case by case evaluation in contract. I mean, there are so broad guidelines that will then have to be looked at on a specific application. I mean, if somebody comes in with an application and they want to just install vinyl windows everywhere, that likely would be denied on the basis that it's not consistent with the guidelines, and we would also unlikely approve it under a permit process anyway. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think it does. Uh, mm -hmm. but I just add though that there's three things here. Right? What, what this board approves for a project, there is what's eligible for Mills Act, and there's what are going to be high value things. Obviously, it's going to be restoring wood windows is going to be high expense. Obviously, that's much more uh, compelling for a Mills Act application than some of these taking up a wooden platform. Right. So there's, I think there's, and also because this criteria is applied to all sides of the house, we have much more criteria for the front of the house and the back of the house. So I think, I think the dangerous point they all factor in. If you're coming forward and you're saying we want to restore all wood, wood windows to the way they were in you know 1920, that's going to be pretty compelling. Versus we're going to take all the vinyl windows out. But also if you're saying the front ones are going to be Wood, but the back because there's no original heating in the house, and those are the ones that will pain and we need to use vinyl. They're not ineligible for your application. In other words, the application could have that type of criteria, and it would fit the application. Whether the city approves or not is another story. I just hope that Mills Act is a little bit more stricter in the fact than other parts of it. Uh, second, last question would be uh, for existing contract holders. How would this be effective for them at one point? 
So that has never been sacrificed before I can speak to it. So we have a lot of contracts and they all will not be anywhere near consistent with the heading program. So most likely what would need to happen because they all have tenure work plans is that they will all need to be evaluated come the close of tenure. We have three contracts that were grouped in 2013. So those contracts probably went into back in 2014 in terms of tax savings. So we'll need to address that. So most likely what would happen is what we're recommending for all future contracts, basically approach those owners saying your contract will run out. And so you intend to issue a notice of non-renewal unless you come forward and demonstrate that you, you've spent more money uh, than you saved under this new criteria. Or uh, you have future projects and then basically extend your contract further. Because, you know, again, just let those 11 contracts just be out there forever. Thank you, Dan. Just a follow up on that. So, <laughs> the work plan that, for example, we have for 10 years, but that stay intact for the reminder of my period. Yes. What were the changes you make now impact that before that work plan? So, yeah, your work, your contract is good for that full 10 years at the end of the So, 2027, we'll have a conversation. And then you're saying that in 2027, it rolls over for another 10 years, depending on what's Yes, and so in 2027, that would be an example of where we would need to discuss if you have more work to do or if you spend a lot more money on outdoor work and you need more time to recoup the cost. And if neither of those two things are true, then the contract would then be subject to a non renewal. And then it would expire out in 10 more years with diminishing savings. Thank you. Thank you. The, the, the new rules would not be retroactive. They're retroactive as far as contracts that have been in place in the past. It's only the next renewal and the new contract. Correct. Everybody will get the initial 10 years that they proposed under their work. Yeah. But then any reconsideration would now be subject to the new program. Okay. So if most of their money were expended in bathroom kitchen remodels, that probably would not be a uh, a reason to extend their contract any further. That would be the new money that we spent. You have a question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Brian Burton, 126 North 2nd Street. Um, I don't want to break a lot part of the presentation, but, and, and this may be a term of art, but one of the references to whole house, whether it's with respect to electrical or plumbing, what? Mm -hmm. Over time, our house folks have done this part of the piping, that part of the piping. I have to break down the walls to get the sum, so that hasn't been done. You know, Uncle Uncle Jerry did this section over here. Um, I assume that whole house doesn't necessarily mean the entire house, but rather a substantial part thereof. I don't know if that's true. Um, if it is, I just um, I didn't know if it needed to be clarified. But maybe I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I mean, I most houses don't have had electric work done over time, but if you have new components from years ago, and you break that up, I think the idea is you're as many things as people want to do to the stage of the product. And you're going to have a kid, and the kid is going to be for a substantial rewrite of the house. You know, they're not going to say, well, you see what these things are going to do. But the idea is not only you want to do it, it's not going to do it. Um, I'm sorry, not just going to be a future project or a second stage. I mean, the idea is we're doing a whole house project where we're going to do it. I mean, we could more clearly define what we mean, our percentages, but like it's, I mean, to some degree, you don't want to necessarily be too prescriptive either. <laughs> and this is where why we're always being kind of a case by case evaluation. Right, that makes sense. Did I answer your question? Um, I, I also got instructions from my wife about a broader comment to make, but it sounds like this is not the time to do that. Oh. Is that right? Or is that okay? I don't think so. It's, yeah. I mean, it's very general. She and I are always one mind, of course. Um, and uh, so, she, so she said, you can feel, feel free to throw me under the bus when you say this and say it's my opinion. But um, she wanted to thank you all for all of your work on this. Um, 
also encourage you to, to think about keeping things on the simpler side rather than the more complex this is implementation for homeowners, but it's certainly for staff also to be a huge time suck. Um, sort of how to interpret more simple rather than less simple. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. but, but simply a, a general uh, spirit um, that she uh, she um, wanted me to come back. So anyway, thank you everybody. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. We started this process. It was a line added rigorous with lots of checks and balances that are not onerous to the owners to staff. You don't have to put it in once they're there. They're pretty easy to do. And because of that, the city cover a lot more inside. Which I, we are on the road towards that. And so the idea is that a lot more when you can say, and there's some rational, it's not, you know, you win and you get both back and forth and you have to make a The idea is that there that everyone who's doing this stuff is important. It's hopefully eligible and will ideally you know, be able to do it. And that to Ferguson for that. So that's the goal. And then, so I think that's where, to Daniel's point, we had some applications in uh, years ago. And A, they weren't judged against one another, but just kind of up or down. And B, um, uh, they had a lot of stuff that was really unapproved. And then we go this way. So I think this is really going to make it so easy, hopefully. That a homeowner can take the application with the criteria to say, hey, that's exactly what we're doing. Have a pre inspection. So the city staff and I said, oh, yeah, this is the kind of stuff we encourage people to do. So when you pay your 1600 and put your application in, you feel really good that depending on how large the pool is, you will get a mosaic that just year one, perhaps maybe you won't because there are too many applications, but you're really in the queue. Of course, before it was really. And you are witnessing probably the most nuanced detail that might be meeting that we've ever had. And, and so that future meetings to be more streamlined. That's, that's why we're down in the weeds. I mean, yeah. Hi, my name is Len Lloyd. Uh, I'm at 155 Alice. So, um, yeah, first of all, I appreciate all you guys' work on this and the staff as well. I moved here. To Campbell and farther up Peninsula because um, I really liked the historic aspect of the town and the different structures. So that's really kind of what drew me to this area. So I think the time that you spent and how you work in government, myself in a voluntary capacity, is really great. I wonder though, when I hear about the structural aspects, I wonder if. The, the intent of the Mills Act is also to have it be so that people want to buy these homes and want to make, have them livable for their families. So while I, I think that the structural, the emphasis on the structural piece is very well done, I wonder though, you know, you have to have it, as you might have a few comments, livable inside, because you are buying a historic property that if you didn't have those restraints, you, it would be, in a sense, perhaps more valuable if you didn't buy the historical um, property because you'd have more rights to do with the land and things like that. So as a person who is trying to be a, um, uh, a steward of historical property, I, I feel kind of like you're giving up something from an economical point of view anyway, um, because you're limiting yourself in terms of how you can use that land. Uh, or the ability to resell it in the past. So things like, but even just like landscaping, my yard is just wood chips. There's nothing in my yard. And it looks, I think, awful. And I can't imagine that's what it looked like 100 years ago. Um, so I would think if you wanted to try to keep it beautiful, that those things, within reason, of course, you know, should be maybe allowed. It's not structural. But it certainly is about whether neighbors go by or prospective residents go by. Does it look beautiful? Um, and maybe you know you also could put in things you know where the homeowners have to make their homes available for tours or things like that, <laughs> city tours or historical tours. So there could be a give and a get. I, I know that might be too onerous, but I just think that that if you really want to kind of make sure it's helps the town, not just a, that it's the structure is there, but that there's beauty and that it helps everybody else's property values. And it's a reason why people want to move to Campbell, even if they don't buy 
or can't buy an historic home. So I, I guess it's just a way of saying, if you limit it only to structural, I wonder if you take away some of the reasons of having a Mills Act, which is really, I thought, to, to encourage people to buy these historic homes and to keep them beautiful, and so the whole community benefits, not just the, the that home. Valid point. Yeah. Anyway, yes, I'm a very good planner. I thought of that. I 100% agree. The whole outside of the building. Property. The property. The inside, the outside, the, you know, for a living today, people aren't going to walk into our house. And I know it's a very hard thing to balance, and you don't want to give a free ride and all those things, but I would just say, like, the landscaping to me is very much a part of kind of the feel of a home, kind mm -hmm. of. So maybe you put in there things that has to be reviewed or something so that you don't have, you know, people abusing it, but maybe you keep that open. The other thing is, you know, in the house, you walk in and the walls are bad and it's plaster and you need to redo some of the walls internally because they haven't been upkept for 50 years. I don't think that would, um, that would be part of that, right? You wouldn't be eligible. If you had to have, if you had plaster walls and you had to kind of, there were holes in them and they were dilapidated or things like that, would that be part of the allowable um, uh, expense or something? But to me, that's also keeping with the, the home and trying to preserve it. So anyway, thank you. Well, just one comment on that, because I think Campbell is very different than a lot of our chronic cities and territory in Montana. That we really focus on the exterior of the house and the street state, the street facing side of the house. Uh, those other two cities and several others around here, you can't do anything on the inside of your house. In Campbell, at least as of today, you can uh, at the inside of your house, but you can modernize the inside of your house, take out those plaster walls, do all of that. And as long as you're preserving the exterior, that's what the city cares about. But part of the Mills Act criteria is to be in line with that because. If you do a beautiful job of throwing it outside of your house, spend a lot of money, you can get a mills act, even if you tear out half the walls in your house and make a great room. So they really are kind of there's a very different criteria in Campbell for inside versus outside, which again, some homeowners really like, especially when it's moving from other areas that are more friction because they want to modernize the inside of the house as long as they have to focus up on the exterior. Sure. And I, I appreciate that. And I think having the flexibility to make it usable is good. But then why wouldn't that, wouldn't that then go to health preserving and kind of keeping the house viable um, and in good condition if you did those things? And I, I'm not talking about kind of black meat, you know, things inside, but just kind of basic maintaining, you know, kind of or fixing old things inside. And I'll do that. I mean, very, that's a very good perspective. It's a perspective that many cities do share, but we have our marching orders from the city council. So they made it fairly clear what they're looking for in the ordinance. So we're having to follow through with that direction. But to the point in terms of the walls, so electively adding and removing or opening interior walls, so you want to have an open floor plan or you want to create some new rooms, that would not be helpful. Or you want to punch a hole in the wall to connect your kitchen to living room, not helpful. But if you need to reinforce the framing of those existing walls, that would be helpful. Well, and let's make the distinction also between what's allowed just you know, for permitting yeah. purposes, as well as what then, because then there's a higher bar for what can be deducted, uh, if, you know, for tax savings purposes. So the, the city is quite liberal compared to other cities in what is allowable, but then there's what you can sort of get a financial benefit from. That's you know, a little bit more restrictive. And what you read here tonight it is, you know, seeing some interior stuff that you can't quite get financial gain from, but, you, but you'd still be allowed to do it, generally speaking. So there's that distinction. This work preservation is different in every community. Anyways. All right. Um, Unless there's any other further questions or discussions, we will adjourn and then I.
going back to our calendar here. So, so right now, uh, February 28th, you said we'll, we'll know more later if it's going to be at 7 p.m. Yeah, so uh, we'll see if we finish today. Wasn't a guarantee, uh, but we'll be able to reach out to the planning commission and see if we can get a quorum for a 7 a.m. meeting. And then again, we'll be at 6 a.m. start or 6 p.m. start that evening. And then we also will have the regular meeting of the HPP on the 20th. At the joint uh, meeting with uh, planning, are we going through everything we've discussed the first three sessions with them, or is there kind of a you do composite. composite. Here's the three points that we want to bring up to them. I should have asked that question before. I said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I'll need to write a memo that does a high level summary. Obviously, we won't be able to get into all of this. Um, I mean, it was fine. I mean, for the most part, the planning commission won't really have much of a role. I mean, the planning commission. They have no role in those actions. They will not have a role in fines or penalties because that would be a recommendation. I believe, I believe that would be imposed by the director, appealable to the city council with recommendation by HPD. And then, in terms of permitting, my commission will not have any purview on residential properties, which will either be decided by like a list from. Principally, which would be decided by either staff directly or via the ACP by recommendation. So, their purview is still relatively limited to just commercial buildings that happen to be on the HSI. So, for the most part, this doesn't really affect them. The reason they're being brought into the loop, however, is because all these changes are done part of the zoning code. So, they will need to make a formal recommendation of, for the ordinance to the city council. That's just kind of a more of a disclosure of what's been happening because they're not aware of this at all. Okay. So hopefully just give a high level brief presentation to that question. Right. All right, that's the end of it. I will adjourn this meeting till February 22nd. Thank you. Okay, good.